Hello, welcome to Digital Futures for Good, the 2024 conversation series from Good Things Foundation. Facing into a general election, we thought this year would be a good year to explore the transformational nature of technology, but also which policies we would like to see to fix the digital divide for good. This is episode two. I'm here with Martha Lane Fox. Martha has done so many things. Um, I first met Martha in 2009. That's it. When Martha was um, a appointed. lot younger. <laughs> <laughs> we were both a lot younger. We were both a lot younger. Uh, Martha was appointed the uh, digital inclusion champion uh, by uh, Gordon Brown. Um, she uh, is the chair of We Transfer and the director of Chanel, which I think is obviously going to be very exciting. Um, have been on the board of Twitter and Marks and Spencer's Channel 4, uh, the Chancellor of the Open University, the President of the Chambers of Commerce. I've got a lot of ridiculous titles, haven't I? I mean, <laughs> they really um, are completely preposterous. And a crossbench peer, of course. Um, and uh, we also uh, talked about digital inclusion when you did your inquiry into the long-term effects yes. of COVID-19. So you've done a lot and I've only scratched the surface. So welcome, Martha. Lovely to see you. Um, the first question, I want to kind of look right back to those dot-com days. Yes. Um, so you were the co-founder at lastminute.com. And I've heard you speak in the past about how you really saw the excitement of the potential of the internet and, and hoped for it to be a force for social good. Um, just take us back to those heady days. What was that like? Do you know, it's funny when I talk to Brent, my co-founder, we have wildly different memories of this period of time. I remember fundamental chaos just all the time in our you know, company, how we were building technology, the teams, all of the things you were scrabbling to try and do in those early days. He remembers a kind of carefully made plan where everything went completely right. I'm being a bit unfair. But the thing um, about the late 90s was that it was this combination of suddenly possibility for lots of reasons. There was a change of government. Britain felt there was all the cool Britannia stuff going on. Entrepreneurship was growing. And then, boom, the internet arrived properly in people's consciousness. In the early 90s, it was kind of taking hold in America, Amazon was launching and then it came to Europe and we were one of the first European e-commerce companies. But it was still a very big sell to people to make them believe that both the internet was going to survive, last, be enduring, and people were going to buy stuff on this weird kind of technology. I don't think so. I mean, my friends thought I was completely insane for suggesting people were going to put their credit cards into the internet. So all of that was happening, but it did feel, and I really remember a couple of places that I was doing um, speeches about, you know, the power of all this stuff, thinking to myself, you know, look at me, I'm a 25 year old woman, I had not come from a technology background, this is changing the world, right? I'm going to have this, in not me, but the Technology is going to have this incredible effect. There are going to be new voices, new power, money is going to flow in different ways. I think that was slightly over optimistic and wildly wrong as we now understand it. But it did feel like a different time. Definitely did. One thing I don't think I ever told you is actually, I think I wrote to you at those times. Did you? <laughs> Feels now maybe a little bit of a fangirl, but anyway, oh, um, because I was working in the internet for social good, for, for education, for um, helping people have that kind of second chance learning. Um, and I think we all felt that there was going to be this democratization. Um, do you think anything has improved because of the internet in that way? Yes, I mean, I do. I really do. I think that uh, it's just not as much as I think some of us thought, as much as, frankly, I thought about it deeply. I think what I imagined was that there would be a wave of new kinds of powers emerging, and I didn't imagine what would happen would be that Silicon Valley dominance would just be so incredibly intense. And, you know, Europe is making massive headway if you look at it through a kind of startup lens and building businesses. And Brent, my co-founder, has gone on to do a huge amount around building entrepreneurship capacity in our um, country and in Europe. But fundamentally, you know, if you look at where the power lies in the technologies that dominate our lives, no surprises, you've talked about it a lot, everyone talks about it, Silicon Valley, China, and then to a degree, some other kind of balkanized states. And that is just still quite a surprise because I don't think I'd thought that the money would flow to such a tiny handful of players that if you started a company that probably you're going to sell to Google because they've not only got a lot of money, but they've also got the compute power to ramp your business. They've got the markets to scale. The same is true of Meta, whether it's Netflix, Amazon. So I think that's the bit that's been a bit surprising. And I just never really thought that it would be such a concentration, I guess. 
Yeah, absolutely. And for yourself personally, in 2004, you had that horrendous accident. I mean, changed your life incredibly. Did that change your perspective about technology at all? I don't know if it changed it. I mean, I think people sometimes think you have that terrible experience in your life. You have 360 degree into something totally different. I don't think that's what happened to me. I think what happened was that it just made me more determined about a bunch of things that I was I cared about before but I just wanted to make sure that I didn't lose sight of really fundamentally in my life you know when you can't have a normal working life which is what I am not really able to have right now I have a lot of work but it's just a bit more flexible then I think it allows you to focus on the things that you really want to focus on and I think the accident made me realize that I am really interested in social issues in social justice in that intersection of tech and society as opposed to just tech in the commercial world which is important and fuels a lot of the other stuff but i think that's where i really wanted to put my time so we first met when gordon brown appointed yes. you as digital inclusion champion yes. um, the acronym of which did not escape my friends <laughs> and i did talk to them for 10 about that but they're like oh don't worry about it <laughs> um, so it feels like, so 15 years ago, it feels like a long time ago, but do you think much has changed around digital inclusion? Didn't do a very good job, did I? I think, um, I mean, I think, what do I think? I think two things. I think firstly, that there are a wider constituent of people that are more aware and talk about the issue and are trying in some way to have, keep the conversation alive, think about the policies, do the incredible work that you guys more connected to the ground. And I think corporates are more into those conversations. I think governments, although we would argue maybe they haven't done enough, I think it's more known. So I feel as though some things have shifted, but I think I feel depressed when I look at the absolute numbers. And I very naively, and I wish I hadn't now in retrospect, said, oh, we can have everyone online by the Olympics. That was my kind of ambitious goal for the country because I thought, these aren't big numbers. You know, this is like a small scale up tech company to get 10 more million people using technology. It's not, we know what to do. You've known what to do for decades, right? So I feel naive now when I look back and I approached it a bit too much like a kind of business problem that could be solved, not using necessarily business tools, but just that ambition. Um, and so I think that's the depressing part of it, the absolute numbers, which ultimately is the main judge. But I do think that there is more um, attention potentially around the issue, not just from governments, but the wider network of people that need to make it happen. And, uh, you know, Recently, I talked in the Lords and Baroness Stoll's debate. I know you had her on your podcast as well. And just to see the work continuing, and she uses so much stuff that was early days language and continuing the fight. So I think that some things shifted. And I, you know, I did get some money out of Gordon Brown. We got 30 million and it led into the creation of the government digital service when I was working under David Cameron. So all these things are linked. You know, I really deeply believe that we have to continue to reform public services using the best technologies. And to do that, we mustn't leave anybody behind. It's absolutely essential that neither piece of work stops, in my opinion. We can't not keep reimagining the state for the modern age by saying, oh, but all these people can't use technology. Not okay. Bring them all into the technological landscape, create better public services, and then a whole bunch of better stuff has happened. So, those things are, you know, continuing to be teased out from different angles. So I think something's changed, but not enough and not fast enough. Yeah. You know, I fundamentally agree that we should bring people to public services, not keep antiquated services uh, uh, alive. But we need that face to face. So in the communities, those commu that community support. And I know when you were the digital inclusion champion, you went out and visited. I know in the House of Lords debate, you spoke about meeting young men in Leeds. Yes, I've told that story so many times in the last 15 years, but you know, that's fine because it was a really important story that made me think about the profundity of some of this stuff. You know, I think this is true. When I, I got a call from number 10 when I was in my crazy karaoke business, Lucky Voice, I started a karaoke joint, got 10 bars around the country, you hire a private room and you sing with your friends, right? Could not be further away from the digital world. It's a real world business. And I was in the office headquarters we have in Soho, and I got a call on my mobile and they said, oh, it's number 10. Um, the Prime Minister would like to speak to you. And I honestly thought it was one of my friends <laughs> making a joke. I'd not been, I wasn't in that circle. I knew Sarah Brown a bit, but that was not my world. But it was Gordon Brown and he wanted me to look at this issue. And so I thought, God, I don't know anything. Luckily, someone helped me find you very quickly. <laughs> but I thought the only thing you can do is try and shine the light on this stuff and go and see some projects and meet some people. So that's what I did pretty quickly. And I went to Leeds for one of the first visits and I'll never forget, it was just the most shocking day 
dark sky, torrential rain. I was like sliding about with my two sticks. But I met this young man who told me a story and I thought, okay, this really does matter. It's not a superficial issue. It's a fundamental issue about poverty and about inclusion to not just the digital world, but the world. And he looked at me and he said, the internet saved my life. And I was like, hmm, are you sure? Because I don't think the internet really saves lives. There's me like slightly kind of being a bit of a twit. And he said, no, no, it did. Because I was found by this um, charity that we were in, in a bus shelter. I'd been high on drugs for months. They took me in, I dried out. And then they asked me what I wanted to try and learn. And I said, well, I like music. And so he had learnt musical skills using technology and using the internet and he'd been um, making tracks and selling his DJ tracks, miraculously in my opinion, because they were really hardcore, like dirty trance music. And I was like, <laughs> oh, I can't believe anybody's listening to this, but they were. And he wasn't making a lot of money, but the point was he had confidence, he'd learnt new skills, and it was engaging enough to keep him motivated, to keep learning, keep turning up and not go back to drugs. And I don't know if that's the only thing that was going on. Clearly it probably was a, you know, multiple list of things that were helping him but the fact that in his mind it was the internet and that enabler really did sit with me very deeply and I think about it a lot but I was also really thinking about it because just two weeks ago I was in northern Kenya in a refugee camp called Kakuma um, there are 400, nearly 400,000 people in that camp it's been there for nearly 20 years it sits between South Sudan Uganda and Burundi and Eritrea. It's a tough piece of the world that we do not hear about very much. And I was there with a charity called I Am The Code, focused entirely on girls in refugee camps, helping them learn digital skills. And different place, different time, space, continuum, different set of challenges. But what I saw in those girls was exactly the same as thing as I had seen in Leeds, which is not inherently the technology, but the confidence that they were gaining by having access to cybersecurity courses, learning about AI. You know, they were showing me the web pages that they were building and the window on the world it was creating for them. You know, their future is tough, and by any stretch, the internet is not going to suddenly be like, boom, problem solved. But my God, it was helping them to feel valid, seen, and as though they had some skills. Long answer, but you know, they top and tail the last 15 years, those stories. So it's still just as important. So Martha, you're in those rooms, you're getting phone calls from prime ministers, you're in the House of Lords, take, again, the debate. And I think you said in the House of Lords debate that you've told 200 secretaries of state your story about. <laughs> At least, I reckon. <laughs> the young man in Leeds. So why aren't they listening? You know, why, why actually has the politicians focus on including people, not leaving people behind, use your words, why has that interest actually gone down? I think about, I mean, you must think about this all the time as well, and I'd love to hear what you th think. I mean, my perception is the following, which is there's always shades of politics around every industry sector, if you like. Technology has been so political because it's shiny new thing, it's kind of geopolitically important, it's also cool new startups, innovation, it's an opportunity you don't have to put on a hard hat and you can like, be a politician standing by something cool. So. The way that technology lands in governments is kind of interesting because, in my opinion, it's never the hard work of actual, you know, connectivity, the content, all the things we're talking about. It's always about the photo op, op and being seen as the best place to start a digital business, be an AI company, you know, be a startup, whatever it might be. And that's just been a narrative that has been more dominant in this particular shade of government. You know, I, I really want to give a shout out to Gordon Brown because he got this. I really do think that. And he gave some funding to you guys through our work and he understood that it was important. You know, he, he wanted to create this role and he wanted someone to fill it. So I do give him credit for that. And then I also give some credit to the coalition government because although I think this part of the puzzle wasn't as dominant, they did see the case for reforming public services and trying to include people. And I have you know, I know that David Cameron really understood the point that if you are unemployed and yet, as they are, 99% of jobs are only advertised online, you're screwed. So I think that there have been shades of it that have landed well, but I think the fundamental issue is that the way technology is in government, it's either hideous IT projects that we are, but stay away, stay away, or it's like, oh great, opportunity to be photographed with sexy new startup. And kind of that grunt work of the middle stuff has often taken a back seat, especially in a universe of so many changing ministers and prime ministers. Um, so I think it's, I don't think it's a, 
kind of malicious thing that's happened. I just think it hasn't been on a priority list and technology has had other priorities in prime ministerial eyes. That's right. I think, though, um, I mean, you did, the, you chaired the uh, inquiry in the House of Lords to the long-term impact yes. of COVID, and you're, you had a recommendation yes. that says digital inclusion should be on the agenda. Actually, um, it's great that we're here at Vodafone because they're supporting Good yes. Things Foundation and our mission. And businesses really yes. understood the, the, the need for digital inclusion because of the pandemic. A lot, yes. Not only because of the pandemic, but the pandemic massively put it into their consciousness. But it seems like the opposite happened yeah. for government. It's funny, isn't it? I, I don't know. I mean, I can only assume it's because of the slightly chaotic nature of some of the governments and the, the shades of government in the last um, five, six years. I think that, um, that one of the things that was so horrifying doing that uh, long term implications of COVID committee was finding some of the structural things were still so similar to when we'd started working together n nearly 10 years earlier. And, you know, so many things struck me and the woman who gave evidence to our inquiry said, I'm choosing between data and food. And that's just such an unacceptable thing for one of the richest countries in the world to have anybody face. And then the people that were telling us that they had one device to share between three or four children to a school that didn't really have proper digital skills on the other side of it either. So that whole cycle was completely broken. And there were so many points of, um, of failure, I guess, in that um, pandemic that were exposed because of people's lack of access to technology. And I agree with you, it's it's remarkable that it hasn't therefore been a kind of accelerant into more policy focus on this area. And again, I can only put it down to the slightly chaotic nature of government up until probably the last year or so. The um, case is well made, if you go to look for it, about Everywhere. the... Everywhere. But the economic yes, case... Yes, 100, like 100 billion <laughs> or whatever the number is, isn't it? Something yeah. insane. And so that... Um, I mean, you said actually in the House of Lords that it's the economy stupid. Yes. Um, you then went on Twitter to make sure everyone knew that it was Bill Clinton that said it first, <laughs> um, just in case they didn't know. <laughs> um, but do you think that we need to turn this around rather than it being a challenge, make it an opportunity, an opportunity. to, I mean, clearly the country needs to fix the economy and it feels obvious to me on, on all, all levels yes. that if you don't fix the yes. digital divide, if you leave people behind, then you're investing in all kinds of public services, even if we just take that one sliver. Yeah. Let's, you know, even disregarding all of the other equality of opportunity, etc. Mm -hmm. um, so do you think that we need to make that case better about the economy? Yes, but I think that it's not that it's not been made. I think it's about making sure it's got a place to land where it's really being heard. So it's the two parts, isn't it? And I, uh, I might be dancing on a pin, but it seems to me that it feels like the case has been made endlessly. We've got the numbers, we've had your work, then we had a bit of work from me, we've had more work from the Lords, we've had extra work recently from the Communication Select Committee. I think it is well understood. I think it is just about priorities that people actively choose to make who are in power and where focuses lie. And, you know, governments can't do everything. They make active choices clearly. And the Cameron government, coalition government chose to put a lot of attention into technology, into startups, into building our robustness as a kind of commercial technology sector and into reimagining the state because that was a bit what Steve Hilton was interested in who worked for David Cameron. You know, it comes down to those personalities very often. And I just hope that in then after the election, whatever the shade of government, that people will look around and think, okay, it's 2025 nearly. What is modern Britain? Well, modern Britain has to be based around the tools of the modern age. And that is across the board, right? We've got to help individuals be powered up. I'm president of British Chambers of Commerce. 84% of our businesses say they don't have the right skills in their business and that they're anxious about technology. 84%, right? And this is the bedrock of our economy, these businesses. So you're not going to be able to power up individuals, power up businesses, and ultimately, therefore, make the state work better if you don't put this as a fundamental building block. And that really isn't a political point, that's just freaking obvious. So I hope that whatever new energy comes after the election, that people will think it's not 1825, it is 2025. Let's imagine what modern Britain really looks and feels like, because we have so much opportunity to do this right. We're a small country geographically, we're a small country population wise. We've got these kind of some centers of excellence in this stuff. We only need to just push that extra bit and finish the job. And that's, I think, what gets me so vexed is it's not starting from way back. It's actually starting from pretty good. Just do it even better. 
So businesses are stepping up, um, obviously charities like Good Things and others, we, we, we're filling that vacuum. So thinking about the new government, having this imagination of this modern Britain. Yes. What do you think they should do? That, that is this a machinery of government? You know, you created Government Digital Services with Mike Bracken and yes. Francis Maud. Uh, is it a new unit? Is it another champion? Do we need a digital inclusion I, champion? I, think, I've, I mean, I don't think we need the outside champion, actually. I think it's, it's got to come from the Prime Minister or someone that, in the Cabinet. I think it's got to be owned by a very senior person, whether it's the Business Secretary, Jonathan Reynolds, or whether it's Peter Carl, who does the tech irrelevant but it's got to be I think a person in government that does this stuff um, I mean the first thing is about connectivity you know we're sitting here in Vodafone no disrespect to any provider but we still haven't finished the job and so that's part of it it's then got to be about making that connectivity affordable to people and then as you have talked about always so articulately it's about that peer-to-peer -peer support you know it's not me or someone that looks like me saying you must get online in fact that's very very unhelpful you need people that feel like the people that are excluded to help them and the prompts to do it don't you so you just need that plan so if i was prime minister heaven help us everything would go to shit but i would make sure we had a plan a proper deep plan and it wouldn't be like the digital plan because i think that's kind of already putting it wrong it would be a plan for modern britain it's like what is it that by 2030 this country is and i would argue we've got to be the greenest economy and the most digital economy that's it and that's what you've got to work everything back and out of fabulous I just want to talk about technology. So you're in all these wonderful political rooms. Um, you're really but, making my life sound fun. <laughs> but also the technologist rooms, and you're always, um, the, you know, very open that you're not a technologist by background. Um, so thinking forward about the new and emerging technologies, obviously we talk a lot about AI and yes. um, generative AI. Do you think that uh, in a decade's time, the technology will be that much easier to use, so the interfaces, that some of the elements, mm -hmm. obviously not all of the elements, but some of those elements around skills mm -hmm. that we talk about around digital inclusion, digital literacy, do you think some of that will will be less important because technology it's, it's, fills it's the void? It's interesting, isn't it? Because I think that that was a lot of some of the pushback that I certainly personally got in the early days of the work I was doing, which was a bit like, but this is just going to sort it out, isn't it? I mean, is it just that the technology is going to get cheaper and better and everyone won't be able to use it. I know that that is, again, not a political point, but MPs of all shades sort of thought that this isn't really an issue because everything's going in the right direction to solve this problem. But we can see that has not happened. And in fact, it's got worse. And in fact, you get more excluded and there's less. Um, it gets harder and harder, arguably, to become um, digitally skilled up. And I actually think that, well, of course you're right in some ways, like will we be coding or will just the AI be coding because it's much better? You know, automatic code is what all engineers I know are talking about, then maybe. But will the tools get easier? Yes, maybe. But we're talking about, I would argue, something even before that, aren't we? We're talking about affordability of some of this stuff, of kit, of connectivity, and, you know, brain space and just um, ability to have the um, conversations that enable you to see the options and the possibilities in this brave new world. And I think you know, the more vulnerable group you are in, the less you have that capacity. And uh, so ironic that for people for whom it might help the most, it is the least likely to be part of their lives. So, you know, I read some really interesting research and in about five years ago, a woman, one of the first people that has done studies about socioeconomic groups and your brain. And what a surprise, if you are living in real poverty, you don't have brain space. Your brain is chaotic. It's wired now chaotically because of the stress of living in relative poverty. So, you know, things like being asked to turn up for a benefits appointment at a certain time, that's just very stressful. And we might all sit there going, well, just turn up and get your benefits. Just like that's the one thing you have to do. But actually that becomes an incredibly difficult thing to do for managing chaotic life. It sounds so obvious. And it's relevant, I think, to digitization because unless you start with real empathy and compassion for what that excluded person's life is like and work out what the use case for them that will make their life better, I don't think we'll crack the problem. And I don't know if that gets solved by better, cheaper, easier tech. I think it needs more proactive intervention than that. What do you think? Well, I think that if we have more personalized interfaces yeah. that can understand that chaotic life yeah. and can under therefore can understand what your needs are, yes. that the tech interface yes. could present to you yes. 
the tools and the services and the sites and the help that you might need. So, but that is a, there's a step in that, isn't there? Yeah. There's a step in the personalization and the understanding and the engagement, which I guess no amount of brilliant tech is going to sort out in the next, I would argue, five to six years, right? I don't disagree with you at all. I think we will get to a point where there is much more um, personalization and much more just command that's not technology led. So you can just speak or you can just say things, exactly. and whatever, it can be you. But that still it requires a bit of a, a moment, doesn't it? Of yeah. Some, some technology intervention, yeah. I guess. We obviously also need to remember about um, privacy and consent and safety. So making sure that people understand the technology that they're using or is being done to them. Yes. And I think within digital exclusion, we really need to be worried about that. Yes, I completely agree, especially as a lot of the groups we're talking about will be very heavy users of government services inherently. And so the transaction there needs to be super clear, doesn't it, about what your education data, what your health data, what your benefits data, all that flow of information. I completely agree. So, Martha, um, I always ask the same last question, which is suspend disbelief. If you were uh, in the general election and found yourself as Prime Minister, uh, the next Prime it's Minister... It's not much of a suspension of disbelief. This is what I amuse myself with when I can't sleep, which is quite frequently. I'm like, what would I do if I was Prime Minister lying in bed? Oh, fantastic. Figure. So maybe you've prepared this one. <laughs> no, I don't get very far. I normally just end up laughing. So imagine you're the Prime yes. Minister. What would you do in the first 100 days to fix the digital divide? Again, I'm not going to say anything that is kind of big new news. I think that the first thing, especially knowing a little bit about how prime ministers operate and what the powers are that they have, you just have to make it your own personal priority. And I would make it a personal priority to build not just the best startups in the world to be the most AI safety place and all the, the platitudes that come out of ministers for the last 15, 20 years about technology, but actually have a detailed plan about what a modern Britain looks like. That's the most important thing. I think the Prime Ministers can do a bunch of stuff, probably less than some people imagine, but the thing they can do is keep a priority at top of mind of their cabinet. We are building a modern Britain, and that means using the tools of the modern age to make sure no one is left behind, that we have put modern technologies at the heart of how we imagine the state, and we are doing it in a really detailed and joined up way, and that is what I would aspire to do. Fantastic, you have my vote. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for coming along and thank you for being part of Digital Futures for Good. Of course. Thank you.